Hey everyone, this is Nick, and yes, I did get back into Warhammer 40k, but no, this doesn't have anything to do with this news video. So this week we have a nice Microsoft Surface equivalent that runs Linux out of the box from Star Labs. We also have a look at the theming and customization options for the Cosmic Desktop, and we have the release of GNOME 45 with a nice few extra changes. But what will never change is how I handle my segues to my sponsors. This video is sponsored by Tuxcare, your all-in-one solution to make sure your Linux server or workstation fleet is secure and up-to-date. They offer a range of services like kernel live patching or extended support for distributions that have gone end of life. Now this week they're partnering with Admin Magazine to give you the 2023 special edition of the magazine. It's titled 10 Terrific Tools for the Busy Admin and it contains, as the name implies, a bunch of great utilities that will help you maintain your dot files and manage configuration changes, shape your network traffic to share the bandwidth in the office, scan your system to discover hidden processes that you might not be aware of, using a bastion server to communicate with remote hosts securely, plus a roundup of the best SSH frontends. Every tool is of course well explained to let you know what they can do and how to use them. So if you want to up your admin game, click the link in the description below and get your free issue of Admin Magazine. So Star Labs, a Linux hardware manufacturer, just introduced a refresh of their entry-level laptop, the Star Lite. And it's not just a spec bump, it's a complete form factor change. The device is now a Microsoft Surface-like tablet with a kickstand and detachable keyboard that runs Linux. It's powered by a low-power Intel N200, that's a quad-core 1 GHz CPU that can turbo boost up to 3.7 GHz. It has 16 gigs of DDR5 RAM, 512 gigs of SSD, with options to push that to 2 terabytes. And it has a 12.5-inch touchscreen running at 2880 by 1920. The battery should provide around 12 hours of screen on time, and it has two USB-C ports front and rear cameras, Wi-Fi 5, a micro HDMI port for some reason, a micro SD card slot, and a headphone jack. Now this tablet starts at around $500, with the backlit keyboard costing an additional $100, and it comes with either UK or US English layouts, or French, German, Nordic, or Spanish keyboards. The device uses Core Boot and, of course, runs Linux with a choice of pre-installed distros. But looking at the hardware, there shouldn't be any issue installing anything else on it. It doesn't look like there's any digitizer or stylus support, though. And on paper, this looks like a really, really cool device for the price. Now, the CPU is obviously not a beast by any means, but we're sorely lacking in these two-in-one tablet form factors that run regular, standard Linux distributions, so this is very, very welcome. I reached out to them to see if I could get a review unit. I'll keep you posted. Now, something I missed last week, System76 shared some details about how they will allow you to customize the look and feel of their Cosmic Desktop. So, of course, you will get the usual accent colors and light and dark modes, but they go beyond that. You will be able to change the application background color, the tint of the text, and even the corner radius and the interface density for Cosmic applications. So, when selecting your colors, you will get something akin to Material U. Other colors for the UI will be derived from the ones you picked to ensure everything has some nice contrast. Cosmic will also have an application API to let developers create apps and widgets for Cosmic, and that includes support for the theming options for Wayland and a widget library. They also showcased how tiling windows using your mouse will work, with indicators showing you how things will be placed before you drop the window in place and it gets tiled. Finally, they showed their notification center that won't live in the date and time panel in the new version of Cosmic, it has its own indicator, and they implemented password prompts when an action requires super user rights. And it all looked pretty good in screenshots, and I really like the customization aspect and how they've approached it, but I'm afraid that this will make every other app that is currently available for Linux look completely out of place on a Cosmic desktop. So I hope they find a way to address that and maybe automatically recolor other windows, for example, Libid Vita ones or KDE ones. It would be a lot better in terms of user experience. Now, Sousa will stop being a publicly traded company just two years after it was listed on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. 
They announced that their majority shareholders intends to take the company private by merging it with another entity. Sousa is currently majorly owned by a subsidiary of an investment firm, which will, of course, still retain control after the move. Sousa's CEO said it's a strategic opportunity, probably meaning it gives them more leeway to focus on what they actually want to work on instead of focusing on trying to please shareholders in the short term, even if it goes against long-term business goals. Granted, they're still a company with the purpose of making money, but at least they won't have to focus on trying to raise the share price just on getting some good business. This plan to make Sousa private should conclude at the end of 2023. And it's interesting to look at the direction major Linux enterprise companies are going. You've got Sousa going private on the one hand, you've got Canonical still planning for their IPO in the future, and you've got Red Hat, owned by IBM, and doing some really weird anti-community behavior that really makes people think that it's IBM and the shareholders that make Red Hat turn into a worse company than it was before. Now we've got some more details about GNOME 45, with another interesting feature coming to it, which is managing the keyboard backlight from the quick settings. A new keyboard button will be added, and clicking it turns on or off the backlight of your keys while clicking the little arrow will reveal a slider that lets you change the intensity of that backlight. Of course, you can generally just use your keyboard's keys to adjust this, but not all keyboards or laptops have these. Some Linux manufacturers actually had to add that stuff back in their own control centers, like Slimbook RGB for Slimbook or Tuxedo Control Center for Tuxedo. So these types of quality of life improvements in GNOME are always nice to see, like not everyone will have a use for it, but if you don't have keyboard backlight keys on your keyboard, then it's better than rigging up some kind of script and creating a custom shortcut. Now, the GNOME 45 beta is also now out, with a bunch of improvements. Mutter, the compositor, will now handle display hardware in its own thread, which should result in smoother mouse and window movement on screen. And Mutter also added support for the YUV color model, YUV. Gnome Web got a tab overview, Loop is now the default image viewer for Gnome, Snapshot replaced Cheese as the camera utility, and there are improvements to the file manager, the disk usage analyzer and the phone viewer were ported to GTK4, and Gnome software will apparently force the use of its own software sources dialog instead of the ones distros have been adding on top of it. And there are more improvements all around to the settings and the default apps. And while this isn't in the beta just yet, the new activities indicator has also been finalized as a clean implementation and will apparently be included in GNOME 45 when it releases. I like that change. I think it looks good. It gives more indication about your virtual desktops than just having the activities text. So that's good. And features that are often mentioned in relation to GNOME 45 but that I couldn't confirm were actually implemented are support for accent colors and the new presentation for fractional scaling, which kind of looks like what macOS is doing. I'll obviously take a look at GNOME 45 when it releases next month, and I'll make a dedicated video about it. Now, we have more details about changes we can expect in Plasma 6 this week, starting with icon themes. On Linux, icon themes provide multiple sizes for each icon, so they can look right at any size. The issue is that they often change the entire style of the icon at smaller sizes, for example, a 16 by 16 pixel icon will generally be monochrome and symbolic. This created a problem in Plasma. Widgets automatically adapted the icon size they used and could move to full color versions in some cases and keep monochrome icons in other cases, resulting in a bit of a disjointed look and feel. In KDE 5, they solved the issue by adding Plasma specific icons, but this made theming a bit of a mess. So in Plasma 6, they adopted the same convention as in GNOME. They will use only the icons from the icon theme and look for symbolic icons specifically where they need them. And since Linux is clever, if a symbolic version doesn't exist, it will automatically fall back to the non-symbolic version instead. And this is a great change because developers and theme creators don't really have anything to do to make sure that everything works, especially if they already had like a GNOME version of their icon theme, but it will make theming on Plasma look much, much better. Like resizing your panels was always a gamble in terms of what result you would get in terms of icons. Now, other changes in Plasma 6 include switching to a double click to open files and folders by default. That's now implemented. There's a revamped bug reporting tool that looks simpler and easier to use. 
You now have the ability to see startup logs in the auto start settings page to debug when things aren't working normally. You get an overhauled dolphin settings page and the addition of a search box in the settings of many cute apps. Just some good general quality of life improvements that should really make Plasma 6 a super polished experience. I can't wait to start using it. Okay, and let's finish this video with the gaming news. This week we have the release of Wine 8.14 with support for dumping Windows registry files in Wine Dump and fixes for the 64-bit implementation. It also comes with 30 bug fixes, notably for Dirt 2, The Settlers 2, Freelancer, Warframe, Steam, Yuzu, Civilization 6, or Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions. And as always, you can expect all these fixes and improvements to land in the next version of Proton. Now we also have some progress on the AMD RADV driver to improve ray tracing performance. The code improvement seems to triple performance in Hitman 3 with less impressive but still very good results in other games. The code should probably land in Mesa 23.3 for everyone to enjoy, which is really cool. I currently never use ray tracing even on my Nvidia GPUs which technically could support it with Proton because I feel that the difference in how the game looks doesn't really justify the big performance hit you take. But if performance gets better, then sure, why not? I'll enjoy the pretty lighting effects. Now the Linux kernel also got a fix for the Zen bleed vulnerability that affects the AMD APU the Steam Deck uses. Whether Valve will decide to ship the fix or not, we'll have to see, as it comes with performance penalties, as all CPU mitigations tend to do. But I do hope it won't have too much of an impact. The deck already struggles with some AAA titles and losing even 1 or 2 FPS on average will make a big difference in how good the gaming experience can be. And speaking of performance hit, Foronix benchmarked the performance impact of the recent AMD Inception vulnerability mitigation patches on Linux and it looks like it won't be too bad for most users. People using databases might see some noticeable performance loss in some cases but us regular users on our desktops shouldn't really see anything. And that's really good because when you paid enormous amounts of cash to buy a powerful CPU, it's always pretty annoying to lose 5 to 10% performance with one fell swoop. So of course you can disable these mitigation patches because it's Linux, you can do whatever you want, but yeah, you're risking the security of your device in exchange for keeping the performance you bought, which is never a fantastic idea. What is a fantastic idea though, is this segue to our sponsor. If you're in the market for a new computer, whether it's a laptop, a NUC, a tower or whatever else, and you're planning to run Linux on it, stop looking at devices that only ship Windows out of the box. Buy something from a manufacturer that supports Linux. Tuxedo does just that. They're based in Germany, but they ship to most countries in the world. And they actually contribute to Linux hardware support by creating these devices. And they have a big range that should cover every price point and every need, whether you want an Ultrabook or a gaming laptop or a super powerful workstation or a NUC, they have it all. All the devices are very customizable, all the laptops are openable, repairable and upgradable. So if you need a new computer, you want to run Linux on it, you want to support Linux's development, click the link in the description below and get yourself a PC from Tuxedo. They're really, really good. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications and to write a comment. And if you didn't, there's always that dislike button, but you can always tell me why in the comments as well. And if you really enjoy the channel and you want to support it, there are plenty of links in the description, LibraPay, PayPal, Patreon, YouTube thanks, YouTube memberships, whatever, you know how this works. So thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.